patiently waiting for some more live trials to come and we have an embarrassment of riches tomorrow. We have two live trials that are in the midst of jury selection now and are hopefully going to start tomorrow. I wanted to sort of talk about those cases and tell you the stories behind those cases so that you can start doing some research if you want to and also determining which of those cases you're going to want to watch live because they're both fascinating cases. There's also a few other legal stories in the news that we're going to be covering very briefly this afternoon before we head over to Bond Court and we wanted to talk about some of those cases with you here today as well. So to start it off, we're going to be talking with Vinu Varghese. He is our guest today. He's a criminal defense attorney here in New York City, and it's good to have you here, Vinu. Thank you very much. Oh, it's my pleasure to have you here. And one of the cases that I wanted to talk to you about, because we've heard so much in the news about the Me Too movement and these non-disclosure agreements, especially in Hollywood, and whether or not these non-disclosure agreements are going to sort of last. And now it's happening in the medical field, where we're talking about that as well. Over the weekend, the Cleveland Clinic um, had a big story about them and the fact that this one particular surgeon, Ryan Williams, in 2008 and in 2009 was accused of sexually assaulting two different patients. And those accusations were resolved pursuant to a civil settlement nice. that was then um, not disclosed. It was under seal and it was one of those things that was not provided to the public. What do you think about how these types of agreements are going to play out in medical cases? Well, I think that they have to be respected, first of all. I, I think the the danger here with the Me Too movement is now you've, you've the pendulum has swung, mm -hmm. right? Yes. So now before you had people getting away with things, and now it's the other way. Well, now there's a presumption of guilt. I mean, these cases that this doctor is accused of are old cases, and they were these were settled a long time ago. And the fact that they're coming out, I mean, we shouldn't be hearing about this. I mean, I think that's the first problem. Look, the, these, these people were paid, and, and often in these settlements, there's no admission of guilt. The doctors denied these, these charges, and, and now you have this presumption of guilt. I mean, you know, he's out there. He's a very respected doctor. Right. And, you know, there's this presumption of guilt, and his reputation is now in tatters. Well, and that's, a, that's a, actually a big part of the problem here, because so many times these doctors resolve these cases because they don't want to take time out of their practice. They don't want to, you know, have to cancel surgeries for patients. And so rather than doing that and running the risk right. of publicity and of losing, they do resolve these cases. And do you think that if, if it becomes the case that the trend is towards disclosing everything, do you think we're going to see a lot more trials, Manu, to actually, because doctors are going to, and doctors and any other defendant in any other field sure. is going to say, what the heck, I may as well just try this thing. There are so many cases that you, you hear about and you read about uh, that where the employment attorneys make the advice to the, to the clients who are the business owners, whether it's a professional or a, somebody who owns a business, tells them, look, pay this amount, it'll go away. Mm -hmm. The insurance company has that number, a certain number in their mind right. when they want to make these cases go away. So, you know, when you heard about the, uh, the congressman, Conyers, who I think paid it $40,000 or something along those lines mm -hmm. for, this, for the settlement, that's standard in the, in the employment world right. <laughs> for these kind right. of numbers. 40, 50 grand, make things go away. Right, and, and that's not going to happen so much anymore if these things are now becoming public. It's not going to be worth it. These people, right. the defendants or the people accused are going to want to protect their names, and, and they should. Now, on the other hand, in this particular case with the Cleveland Clinic, the allegations against this surgeon are terrible. I mean, right. they are terrible allegations. And if he is, in fact, a danger to patients, you know, it's sort of reminiscent of what we saw in the Catholic Church where, you know, you saw priests going from church to church sort of being transferred as opposed to being dealt with. And here this particular surgeon went to another hospital rather than perhaps facing um, any sort of real criminal. He certainly didn't face any criminal charges in right. part because the grand jury decided not to actually indict him. Do you think that we should have some sort of just general transparency in all cases where women or anyone could be at risk to such a degree that they are in medical cases and in some of the entertainment cases we've seen? No, because you have so many cases of you know, what I believe are, are false allegations. You have, in this situation, here, you just mentioned the key component here. They, they, he was actually uh, prosecuted. Right. 
Right. He went to, they went before the grand jury, and the grand jury didn't return a verdict of guilty. We've all heard, we're lawyers, we taught at the law school about the ham sandwich yeah, and the right, grand jury. Right. If the grand jury didn't indict, there was clearly, there was minimal evidence. So they found the evidence so lacking, because all that is is just enough evidence to go forward. Yeah. So in this situation, that a grand jury proceedings are secret, and the settlement should have been secret. So, you know, the, the, the danger is, is that there's too much of a shift yeah. now the other way. Right where somebody who's worked his whole life, is working hard, a professional, now gets an allegation, all of a sudden he's, he's now tainted. Now the flip side, what you're asking about, is the, the university that he's working at now. I think there's a little bit of a different situation there, and they should have been, they should have, uh, been able to be, have him vetted. Right? Right. So once this right. came out, then they should be able to look at this and figure out whether um, he, uh, is poses a danger and make that decision. Right. But now it's out in public, so now everybody knows. Well, and, and the problem, too, is that these people often are being tried in the court of public opinion where there's no evidence rules, there's no hearsay rules, there's no judge to determine whether or not something is actually right. rises to the level to be evidence. And that's a little bit scary. I want to move on from that because we don't have a ton of time, sure. and I do want to make sure that we talk about one of the cases, both of the cases, that we have starting tomorrow. The first one that I want to discuss is California versus Jason Ryan. King. Now, this is a case that involves Mr. King is accused. He has two counts of second degree murder, two counts of gross vehicular manslaughter, a number of DUIs. He apparently had a blood alcohol level of 0.14 and was driving the wrong way down a runway street and hit and killed two University of California, South San Diego medical students. Now, Vinu, how do you defend a case like this one? I would try to see first of all whether the, you know how the uh, toxicology report came about. Was it taken by blood? I presume it was a blood test, and see if it was administered properly. Because to be frank with you, a point one four is not that high. Right. So it's not even twice the legal limit. So, and the fact that the guy was driving the wrong way on on a, on the freeway causing this death, maybe there's something else involved other than drinking. Maybe he has uh, some other medical issue. So that's how you got to look at this person and look at him in, in his totality, see what are the ways to do it. The issue here is, though, is the murder charge. Yes, yeah, so the let's murder talk about that. <laughs> yeah, go ahead. The it's murder charge is, I mean, I think it's going beyond, well beyond what should be charged here. I mean, intentional murder. The, the judge, you know, I, I saw the press conference where I should saw so the clip from the, from the trial or the hearing where the judge said that he was advised, he had taken this anti-DWI course, and so he should have known that drinking and driving, it's actually not against the law to drink and drive. It's against the law to be intoxicated right, and driving. Right. So it's presumably, in terms of what he knew, he may have said, well, I'm not drunk. Right. I'm not intoxicated. Well, let's but let's make sure that we're explaining that to the audience because the points that you're bringing up are really important in this trial. He's charged with murder, not not just vehicular manslaughter, right. but murder. And and I agree with you that this might be an overcharge. In California, the statute for second degree murder is it has to be willful. And that's where the judge has actually the defense did a motion to dismiss and said right. this does not rise to the level of the mental status needed to meet this murder charge. And the prosecutors brought up the evidence that he had had these courses right. as a Marine, I think. He's, he's a Marine. So as right. a Marine, he had had these courses. And one was relatively recent about well, the dangers. Two weeks earlier. Two weeks right. earlier, right. About the dangers of drinking and driving. And apparently there was testimony by his one of his best friends that she said to him, you know, perhaps you shouldn't be driving. And the combination of those things the judge found were enough to not dismiss those particular charges. Do you think that that was a good ruling? That's my first question to you. I mean, I know you sound a little bit hesitant <laughs> to say that this is appropriate to go forward. What do you think of that ruling? Are we gonna see that in appeal if he loses? I think so. Yeah. I think so. I think that that's a stretch um, to be charging intentional willful murder in, in a case where, of drunk driving when you have a statute specifically designed for this type of crime. Yeah, right? and, and doesn't it, I mean, doesn't it create a slippery slope? 
I, and isn't that one of the things the defense argued, that anybody who's ever had any sort of seminar or some teaching in oh. school or something at their work about drunk driving all of a sudden now has the right state of mind to be able to say that it's murder? Anyone who's seen a mad commercial right, or a sad right, commercial right. is now going to be potentially charged with murder if they have a drink and go out. And also, like I said, 0.14 is not that high. There are numerous people that you know I've represented over the years who've had blows uh, even slightly higher than that, mm -hmm. and we're just we're driving fine. We're stopped at a checkpoint. Yeah. I mean, the fact that this guy was driving on the other side of the street means that something else was going on. Yeah, and and it's you know we say that, and yet people who had who know people who have been the victims of drunk drivers often say you know one is too many. And the thing that's especially sad and gripping, and I think is going to be difficult for the jury to overcome here, is that the other the, the victims had been at a party and they had a designated driver. So who, the person driving the other car had actually given the forethought to say, I'm not going to put anyone in danger. I'm not going to drink at all and drive. And so comparing that to him, I think, is going to make this case a little bit more difficult for him. However, you know, we've seen in other cases where when they overcharge, when a prosecutor you know, brings a higher charge than maybe what's fitting, it actually comes back to bite them because the defendant escapes liability altogether. Do you think that that's something we could see have happen here? I don't think that'll happen right. here because you have, you have dead bodies. When right. you have dead bodies, the, the jury is most likely going to punish him. One way or another, it's a question of how much. So, you know, in this situation, I think they're going to see that murder is, is extreme. But then again, you don't know. The emotional aspect that you just hit upon is, is going to be very powerful. It's going to be compelling. And the prosecutors, I bet you this is going to be a case where the prosecutor goes overboard because he or she can't help himself. Yeah, you know? absolutely. I mean, you've got, listen, the victims, their names are um, Ann Lee Bad Baldcock, Baldock, and she's 24, was 24 years old. Madison Elizabeth Cornwell, 23 years old. And the defendant, Jason Riley King, is a Marine and driving the wrong way down a freeway when drunk. I mean, it is definitely going to be a compelling case for everyone in that courtroom. You know, the, the family members of the defendant, because this certainly wasn't an intentional thing the way that we normally think of intent, although with this murder charge, we're starting to fall well, into that. Look, first there's an issue of optics. I mean, I was watching the clip of the, uh, the judge's ruling and they're showing mm -hmm. him. He looks terrible. Yes. I yes. mean, he's, he needs to shave. Yep. He needs to get cleaned up. Those, the pictures of those two young ladies, both attractive young mm -hmm. women, and that's going to be another factor that plays it all. Oh, these, were, these were doctors, they were right. pretty. Right, and they're in medical school. Yeah. And, and you know, you, you're you talking about something that I talk about all the time here, and which is, that's trial as theater. Yeah. You know, it really is in many ways that, because jurors are your audience, and they are definitely human beings, and the psychology of human beings is you're more compelled by these beautiful young women whose lives were snuffed out when they were trying to do the right thing and make sure they had a designated driver versus this. Now, what do you think about the fact that he's a Marine? Does that play to his benefit? Well, certainly. I, I think that that's something that his attorney should be using, you know, to yeah. his benefit. Uh, and maybe there's other things here that affected him. Maybe he's suffering some type of PTSD. Mm -hmm. I mean, there are numerous things that are going to have that his attorneys, I'm sure, will look into to see about mitigating this as they move forward. But theater, as you said, it is theater. And unfortunately, it's sad. But these are the things that the prosecutor will be playing upon. So the defense attorney have no choice but to deal with this, particularly because the prosecutors have gone for these enhanced charges. But how do you deal with it? You say, you know, one of the things I think that you sort of at least implied is that you clean him up. I mean, I agree with you. Some of yes. the pictures that we've seen of him, and for a while he was in a, a head brace from the accident himself. Sure, it looked but, like Hannibal Lecter. Right, yeah. right. I mean, hopefully yeah. for the defense, that won't be the case when we see him um, tomorrow, as early as tomorrow. But how else do you counter this story? You know, because anyone who watched the Golden Globes last night when Oprah was talking about stories it really resonated with me because juries hear two very different stories and have to choose which one is true the prosecutor has a great story in this case yeah. if you're the defense attorney what story are you gonna tell I, I guess as you've said you've got to find a scientific story that perhaps the blood toxicology was wrong is is that the best story you might know no I think you, you've already mentioned he's a marine right mm -hmm. this guy is by definition he's a veteran yeah right he's you can start using the word hero yeah. right it's just he's in the military right mm -hmm. the the uh, there's things that his lawyers can do to say look you know he, he may have made a mistake here all right but it doesn't mean he's guilty of murder you right. know and and there's different things that he can do and play upon 
And so again, we, I don't know the scientific background of whether what's, right. what's going on here, but again, a point one four. Again, I keep saying this: it's, is, not, that high, it's yeah. not that high for him to be driving on the other side of the road. It's there's just, something it, else in play. It doesn't make sense here. So, it just no, doesn't make sense. Yeah, that's, there's oh. definitely something else in play. He did reject some plea deals. Um, I don't know if you saw that, but he rejected a plea of 15 years to life plus eight. Uh, he faces 30 to life plus 14. These types of plea deals, it, it sounds like they really were keeping in mind the second degree murder charge as opposed yeah. to the vehicular manslaughter. Do you think that that was a really risky proposition to reject that plea deal or do you think it was a good call? I mean, at those numbers, I wouldn't have taken that deal. Yeah. I wouldn't encourage my client to take that deal. If they're offering like five to ten, something along those lines, then you'd have to push push that. But again, you just said it. Those are numbers based upon the enhanced charges. So they're not looking if they offered a plea deal to the lower charge right. and the sentencing range that went with that. Right. Then you probably not go to trial. Right, because that would make sense to take that sort of a plea deal. But <clears throat> it just goes to show. I mean, we talk about this, and I know in your practice you probably see a lot of DUIs, but. That one decision to drink and drive, and to your point, drinking and driving isn't against the law, but it's unless you drive with a breathalyzer in your car, which some people do, especially those who have already been arrested, you don't know exactly when you cross that line. And that decision to drive after you've been drinking can change your life forever, can change other people's lives forever, and can take lives. So it is... It is a it's, a, it's a case, we don't have a lot of DUI cases here at Law News, uh, Law and Crime rather. And so to have a case like this and to be able to watch a trial like this is going to be really interesting, I think. Um, and, and it's probably going to be a case that depends highly on, as you said, the toxicology is probably the major piece of evidence that they're going to hope to, to, to defend against here. Yeah, I mean, I, I presume it was blood, but I'm not sure. I mean, if it, if it was a breath test, then the defense could have a field day with that because it's been shown that the breath tests aren't as accurate as, uh, even though they're, they're held to be accurate, there's ways to attack that far more than the blood test. And we'll see. This, this case is starting right now. They are choosing a jury out in California in this case. The minute that we have it live, we're going to bring it to you live. And I know that you're all eager to have some live trials here with us. And so we're hoping to have that as early as tomorrow morning. In the meantime, though, we have another case starting. And we are going to talk a little bit about this case with our next guest, who is going to be here via Skype, because he is, and, and Vinu is going to stay here with me as well to add his two cents. But our next guest is a special